the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to read the first 12 verses. We'll be looking at other verses in this chapter eventually. But to, to begin with, we'll begin with the first uh, 12 verses of Luke 24. Now upon the first day of the week, or early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, uh, stooping down. Uh, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which had come to pass. Let's pray. Our Father, I ask you this morning to bless us with your word. Lord, uh, help us uh, as we consider once again as we do at least every Easter and sometimes other times your resurrection. May we understand why it is, Lord, that there had to be proof of your resurrection. That is, people needed to see you in a resurrected body alive from the dead. I pray you'll fill me with your spirit. Uh, enable me to be the preacher, teacher that I need to be. And above all else, Father, I pray that you would get the glory. And Lord, I pray, please save anyone that's lost here today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. One of the most important events take place in this world was the resurrection of Jesus Christ fact is, it is the greatest thing that Jesus Christ did for this world. That's not to lessen the life he lived down here or to make little of his death. If Christ had not died and shed his blood for the remission of sins, then we would all be lost. But had he not risen from the grave as he said he would, then says our Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, the preaching of the gospel and our faith would be a vain thing. The fact that Christ arose from the grave provides hope far beyond this life. Because he arose from the dead, showing he has power over death, provides for those who believe on him that they too shall not have to face death. The Bible of, speaks of two deaths. That word death means separation. The first death is the separation of the soul from the body. I don't need to tell you that this body is wearing out. The second death, if it finds you, is the separation of the soul from God. Because Christ rose from the grave, Believers will not be touched by the second death. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
The Bible clearly states in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Beloved, what a most precious thing to believe that Christ rose from the grave because failing to believe that makes it impossible for anyone to be saved. Now, there are only two points to this outline. And the first one is this. Proof of Christ's resurrection. Proof of Christ's resurrection. Our Bible makes it clear, makes it very clear, that Jesus' bodily resurrection had to take place had to take place. The proof of Christ's resurrection begins first with his death. Now we talked about his death last Sunday morning, but I need to say a little bit more today as we enter into this fact that Jesus arose from a grave. Those closest to Jesus, you might want to write this down because it helps us to understand the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those closest to Jesus struggled with believing that Christ was anything more than dead after he died on the cross. The woman's, or the women, excuse me, that came to the tomb that Sunday morning uh, was Mary Magdalene, we're told, uh, Mary, the mother of James, and other women, Luke 24, 10. And the reason they came was they came to give Christ a proper burial. Now you have to ask yourself the question, if they believe he arose from the grave, would they have come and given him a proper burial? And the answer to that is no. And then, of course, you have the 12 that were told by the women that he was alive. Say their words seemed as idle tales. The word idle tales is another word for nonsense. Have you ever said, when somebody said something to you, nonsense? I'm sure you have. Now watch this. Because they believe Christ was dead. Now, no doubt they knew that he had been crucified. I want you to turn with me to the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John for just a few minutes. And I want to read to you verses 26 through 30. John 19, 26 through 30. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, now the disciple would be John, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Now when he said, Behold thy son, he was pointing to John. Watch this. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour... That disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel of, full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it up on the hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And so we're to understand the disciples saw Christ crucified. In that brief moment, as Jesus' mother and John looked on Jesus, 
as he hung on the cross, Jesus spoke the words, it is finished, and gave up the ghost, verse 30. Hence, those closest to Jesus went to the tomb the first day of the week. Among those, and I repeat because it's necessary, I'll show you something here. Among those was Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. That's what Mark 16, 9 says. Peter, who when asked by Christ, who do men say that I the Son of Man am, replied, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we would say he recognized Christ's deity. Is that right? Very important thing. Besides that was John, the other disciple, who reminds us that Christ loved him, was there. And that would be seen in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 2 to 4. Now watch this, because I want you to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 20, and verse 9. There's a very important thing that is said to us that we need to recognize before we go any further. In verse 9, it reads like this. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Would you do me a favor because it will help you later if you have to come back to this book? But above the words knew not, put the word understandeth, understandeth not understandeth not. We'll talk about this now. Watch this. Neither Peter or John, two of the twelve that had heard him teach them that he would die and after three days arise from the grave understood that scripture that had to say he would rise again the third day. Now, turn to Psalm 1610 for just a moment. Psalm 1610. Keep in mind that in the early part of the church and certainly where the disciples were concerned, the only Bible that they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was in the process of being written. But when it says they understood not the Scripture, the reference is to Psalm 16.10. Please look at Psalm 16.10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now, this particular verse has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to better give you a clear understanding of that conclusion, let's look at something that the Apostle Paul said concerning this verse in Acts chapter 13 and verses 34 and 35. Acts 13, verses 34 and 35. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead now no more to return to corruption he said on this wise I will give you the sure mercies of David wherefore he saith also in another psalm 
Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Write this down. Psalm 16.10 expresses the confidence of the lesser David. Now who's the lesser David? David the king. But were applied Masonically to the resurrection of the greater David. Who's the greater David? Jesus. Jesus. Now, watch this. They under that they understood not is clearly evident by the reports of Luke. I turn back to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and we're going to look at just a few things uh, that denote these who essentially didn't believe that he had risen from the dead. But in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, we're going to begin first at verse 21. Verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said unto them, He was alive. And certain of them, which were with us, went to the sepulcher, and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Old Testament prophets, by the way. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, here we see the two men on the road to Emmaus. And these were apparently, at least at that point in their life, what we would call believers. And their hope was in Jesus. And what we, say, what we see here among them is this sorrowful attitude, this sorrowful spirit, because what they're essentially saying, it looks like the hope that we had is gone. Now look at verses uh, 30 through 33. Verses 30 through 33. And it came to pass... As he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Their hopes restored. Why? Because they now realize that Jesus Christ arose from the grave. And how did they do that? Because they saw Him. Watch this. When those two found the eleven and told them that they had seen the risen Christ, and then Christ Himself stood in the midst of them, the Bible says they were Terrified. Look at Luke's Gospel 24, verses 34 to 37. Saying, the Lord is risen. Let me back up to 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, in the midst of who? The midst of the eleven. And saith unto them, 
peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. The word spirit there is another word for ghost. Isn't that interesting? The closest to Christ had they never seen the risen Lord would have come to the conclusion and we will talk about that in just a minute that the preaching of the gospel and faith in Jesus is a vain thing. Now watch this. Watch this. Beloved, when Jesus foretold his resurrection, they would not accept it. Look at Matthew 16, please, verses 21 to 22. <coughs> Matthew 16, verses 21 to 22. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I said to you some time ago, what a sad thing that one of the twelve, and of course it would be Peter, <laughs> rebuked Christ. And you know, rebuke's a serious thing. Pastors are called to rebuke. When somebody's doing wrong and not living in obedience to the Word of God, and especially if they're a Christian under a pastor's leadership, he has a responsibility to rebuke them. But let me tell you something. Rebuking Christ is a different story. None of us in here should ever be able to rebuke Christ. In the first place, he never did anything wrong and he never told a lie, such as sometimes we do. <coughs> Look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 44 and 45. Let's just add a little bit more to it. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, <coughs> verses 44 <coughs> through 45. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the hands of men. But they understood not the saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, means they didn't understand it, and they feared to ask him of that saying. In other words, we don't want to hear it the second time. Now, let's see if we can put some things together. First of all, they saw him cleanse the leper. And they saw him cause the blind to see. They saw him raise Lazarus from the grave. They loved him and never wanted him to depart from them. They just refused to believe that first of all, he would die, much less that he would arise from the dead. Have you ever been a person that refused to believe something? Uh, let me give you an example that I've seen often. A person is dying. They're in the fourth stage of cancer. We all know the fourth stage is a serious one, isn't it? And they come to their children or some relative and they said, I'm going to die. 
That relationship between the one that's going to die and the one that they just talked to is a very close one. They love that person and because they love that person they say to themselves, that's not going to happen. I mean, after all, isn't there all kind of doctors out here? Isn't there people that have been cured of cancer? And so they just refuse to accept it. That ought not be hard for us to understand. But His presence as the risen Lord opened their eyes to a very great truth that He arose from the grave. Look at Luke 24, 45. Luke 24, 45. Open their eyes. Luke 24, 45. We'll back up to verse 44 and read the two of them together. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. <clears throat> what was needed? His bodily presence. It was needful for proof of his resurrection that Christ be seen alive after the resurrection. Everything that Christ ever taught be depended on him being seen alive after his death. Christ's resurrection was the supreme, write this down and hold on to it. I'm going to give you a verse in just a minute. Christ's resurrection was the supreme validation of his ministry. What was Christ's ministry? You know, everybody has a ministry, the Bible tells us. What was Christ's ministry? Well, Christ's ministry, when he came the first time, was to die on the cross for sinners and be raised again from the dead. That was his ministry. That's why he came. Everything that he taught pointed to that day when he would hang on that cross and at some point, before he gave up the ghost, he would speak the words, it's finished. What's finished? The ministry for which he came the first time. Now, all of us, one of these days, it's going to be finished. Our ministry down here is going to be over. Hopefully, we will have a good report. From who? Jesus. You know, sometimes people have a good report among men, but a very poor report among Jesus. Did you ever think about that? I think of the many men, so-called pastors, who preach ungodly men into heaven. That don't happen. If, if you're unsaved, if you've never known Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't care how good a man you were on this earth. If you've never trusted Jesus, listen, not of works lest any man should boast. Christ had just run the money changers out of the temple with a scourge in John 2.15. You can back up and see that. The Jews who had been misusing the temple to make money demanded Christ Show them a sign of what, by what authority he did that. John 2.18. Look at John 2.18 for just a moment. I told you I was going to give you some scripture. Look at John 2.18. I wish my fingers would move as fast as my mind. My mind's already slow. Look at verse 18. <laughs> then answered the Jews and said unto him, 
What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Now, what he did, I repeat myself, he run them out of the temple. The Bible says that he made a scourge of several courts, and he run them out of the, ta out of the temple. Now, watch this, because I want you to see this. Christ's resurrection was a supreme validation of his ministry. I just said that to you. Christ responded by saying, watch this, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 19. Of course they concluded that he was talking about the building made with hands. It took 46 years to build Verse 21 says he was talking about his own body. Thus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, write this down, showed his authority especially over death. You know why I don't fear death? I belong to him. I'm going to leave this world. I've got enough sense to know that. Cemeteries don't lie. But, but listen, I'm not leaving here one minute before he decides I leave. Now maybe that's tomorrow, maybe that's 20 years from now. I don't know. I live every day by faith. I tell everyone I know, you need to be ready to die at any moment, any time. But here's the thing. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has power over death. Easily seen by what? His resurrection. Now watch this. Here's the second point. The only second point. The only point of the point. The proof of Christ's resurrection provides great security for everyone who believes on Christ for salvation. If Christ had not risen from the grave, then all preaching of the gospel would be vain. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Excuse me. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So, we're to understand that if Christ had not risen from the grave, all the preaching of the gospel would be a useless thing. And our faith in what Jesus did would be a useless thing. Let's understand something. Salvation in Christ is secured by grace through faith. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Verse 9 Not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith and believing are the same. Salvation is a gift of God. We just uh, read Ephesians 2.8, but let's look at Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. Salvation is a gift of God. For the wages of sin is death... But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me ask you a question here this morning. Would you rather continue in your sins or receive the gift of eternal life? 
Would you rather continue to live as a sinner in this world, having nothing to do with Christ, or receive the gift of eternal life? In this particular verse tells us we have one of two options. We can allow our sin to continue in our life, never finding forgiveness, and we can expect death. Which death is he talking about here? The second death. The separation of the soul from God. Now watch this. God's gift of salvation was paid for completely when Jesus, while still on the cross, spoke these words. We saw it earlier. I'm not going to go back there. But in John 19.30, he said, it's finished. He stated in his prayer in John 17.4, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What is that work? Watch this. Christ came the first time. This is where the Jews really messed up. They were expecting him to come the first time and set up the kingdom. Christ is in the process of building the kingdom right now. I hope you're a part of his kingdom. Because if you are, you've got an awful lot of good things yet to come. So Christ came the first time to this earth to take all the sins of the world upon himself and thereby redeem every believer and he did so by fulfilling the law. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Sometimes we read this passage at Christmas time, and I want to tell you something. It ought to be read a whole lot more than just at Christmas time. Read Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I can honestly say this morning, I hope you can, that because I believed on Jesus, I'm one of God's children. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them believe on His name. Christ shed his blood on the cross was the redemption price for forgiveness. Look at Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. You don't have to turn very far. <coughs> In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Salvation is a gift by grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Because no mortal human being can keep the law. God's mark for righteousness. Christ took our place. Therefore, no works involved in salvation. Ephesians 2.9 Salvation comes to those who place their faith in Christ and what He did for them on the cross. All sinners need do is believe. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Paul and Silas responding to the Philippian jailer when he asked, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Romans 10.9 I want you to turn to Romans 10, 9. I think sometimes people over, overlook this one. Romans 10, 9. I want you to see this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Did you notice in there that if you cannot believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no salvation? And I've shared this with you before, but I'll share it again. Alice's cousin passed away this past year. And as he got closer to death, he became more aware of 
the Bible. He read the Bible through three times. That's probably more than some Christians. But listen, while he was talking with Alice, who was his cousin, and she did not know that he was dying. He never let on. He never told a whole lot of people. He said, I can believe everything in there, but I can't believe that Christ arose from there. Can you believe that? You can believe everything else, but not the resurrection. Now the family says that because he was searching, he probably found the answer before he died, but I don't know that. I'd like to believe that. I would. Now his family, starting all the way back to the days of his grandfather, basically wanted nothing to do with God. They became very wealthy. I think I told you that Charlie told me on one occasion he makes $15 million a year. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Where does it all go? Where did it go when he died, folks? Tell me. Family sure loved him, or they loved his money, I'm not sure which. But watch this, watch this. Salvation is a heart matter. Not a ritual. Listen very carefully. Salvation is a relationship. You know, lots of folk think, well, you know, there was a day I prayed, asked God to save me. We don't see him anymore in the church anywhere. I forgot some. Or somebody didn't set up straight in the first place. Salvation's a relationship. A good relationship is cultivated. Some of you'll put in a garden one of these days, probably. And you know you're going to have to cultivate it. Because you know there's one thing out there that's a real problem with the garden. It's called weeds. But you know what? If you're going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's going to have to be some cultivation take place. What is that? Well, number one, as a Christian, you ought to grow. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. How do you grow? By desiring the Word. What does that mean? Well, if you desire the Word, like maybe you desire some good thing that you eat, my wife this uh, past week, Wanda made me that chocolate pie and graham cracker with whipped cream. You know you used to do that. And uh, the night before she said, now, if you're going to have that pie, I didn't even know she was going to make it. I didn't know she was capable of doing it lately. She said, you're going to have to make sure that we have the crust. So I did something I've never done before. When I went to the store, I saw two different kinds, and one said gluten-free. My wife is gluten intolerant. At first she thought it was an accident. You know how it is, Lincoln, you accidentally got something you didn't take credit for. It. And I, I did it on purpose. And then she thought, I bet she did do it on purpose. I did. So when we eat the pie, each time I got a piece, she said, make me a big piece. Now, listen very carefully. Desiring something to eat, something good, that's good. But desiring the word of God is better. Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone. <coughs> if you're a Christian here today, you have a relationship with Christ. What does that mean? You walk with Him. You honor Him in your life. You love Him so much you talk to others about Him. You put Him first. You make Him the supreme object of your life. You let Him reign on the throne of your heart. You live in obedience to His Word. See, Jesus said, By their fruits ye shall know them. If you're going to tell somebody that you know for sure you're saved, back it up with your life. 
Confessing Christ before men is one of the most important things a Christian can do. <coughs> this idea of my salvation is private and it's just my business, but love me. You don't know Christ if you use that kind of argument. Watch this. Watch this. Romans 10.9 says our salvation comes to those who confess Christ openly and with their mouth believe he arose from the grave. If we ask in sincerity, he saves us. Jesus said you have not because you ask not. Look at uh, 1 John 5, verses 11 through 14. I love this passage. <coughs> By the way, the book of 1 John has as one of its motives the assurance of salvation for the believer. Look at verse 13. Verse, excuse me, verse 11. This is a record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You Listen to me. You can know your saints. One of the reasons that I have a problem with people who talk about that you can lose your salvation is I have a problem with how it lines up with Scripture. It doesn't line up. Can a Christian do wrong after he's saved? Yes. And this idea that uh, because you think you're saved based on the uh, blood of Jesus Christ, once saved, always saved, and they argue against it, that, man, uh, that's just wrong. No, that's just right. I don't believe that uh, once saved, always saved means I have a license to sin. I tell you what I do believe. I believe that God uh, chastens His children when they do wrong. And he does it because he loves us. And I believe that if you're without chastisement, that you're none of his. But listen very carefully. Verse 13 is very clear. You can know you're saved. But if Christ, listen to this, if Christ had never arose from the grave, then our faith, that is believing, would have been vain, 1 Corinthians 15, 14. I'll put you back there again for just a few moments. I'm coming to a close. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Look at it with me. There are a few things in this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians that I want us to consider here this morning. Verse 14 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also vain. There would be no hope, look at verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. All sinners would still be in their sins, verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Everyone who dies would perish forever, verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. We, we would be the most miserable people. Look at verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men miserable. Death would continually hang over us as a cloud of despair and fear. We would have to come to grips with the fact that we have nothing good to look forward to when we die. No joy, no peace, only a certain hopelessness to look forward to. However, we know he arose from the grave, verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. I don't have to see the risen Lord to believe. Look at John 20 and verse 29. John 20 and verse 29. I don't have to see him to believe. Look what Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 20, 
and verse 29. Then saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. All I need to do is believe on him. Death is destroyed, verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15. Just as Christ is alive from the dead, so will I be, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 21. Now every believer can look forward to the day when he or she will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 52. Look at it with me for just a moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, where the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. Here we see the rapture of the church consideration. The rapture of the church, listen carefully, both those that have died before the, before the rapture, they'll go first, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. And those that are alive on the earth will all go up. No more sorrow, pain, or sin. Revelation 21, 4. We will forever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 But I love this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.8 Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Close your Bibles and look at me for a moment, please. 